Okay, so today um, we have Steve Geiger here. He's from FWC. Okay, there we go. He's from FWC and he um, has a presentation for us and I hope you all enjoy it. Awesome, thank you for inviting me. And try not to spill my water. So it's always a pleasure to get to come do these kind of outreach events. Um, for those that don't know me, I uh, am a graduate of University of South Florida. Um, moved right next door to Florida Fish and Wildlife to the Marine Research Institute uh, in 2001, but I was a student since 88. I have been a member of both St. Pete Shell Club and Suncoast Oncologist since COA was in Clearwater, and I think that was 2009. Um, for those of you that are really truly shell collectors, some of you I know are the crafter side, I joined because I'm a physiologist by training, and I joined conchologist because for me taxonomy is really hard. And um, I know there are people in this room that know more about the taxonomy for some of the species than I do, just to put it in perspective, but I'm going to try to give you a perspective from the state management side about some of the organisms that I know a lot of you love and care about. In particular, today I'm going to focus on gastropods, which is not something that we have a lot of funding for. My base job, um, next slide please. My base job, I was actually hired to study base gallops, and in particular the larval life history of base gallops. My history was in phytoplankton dynamics. I actually got to go to the Antarctic and study copepods. Base gallops, for those of you that don't know, have a tiny little egg that lives in the water column for about 10 days. Um, and I was basically hired to study that life history. And so it's a little bit hard to see on the map, but we studied all the base gallop populations from Pine Island Sound up to Pensacola. I can tell you there are not many base gallops in Pensacola. Um, the sites are a little bit hard to see, but um, we have done restoration in Pine Island Sound, Tampa Bay, uh, huge restoration effort in Crystal River, which mostly predates me, but if you know, we reopened that fishery, was very successful, and then moving on towards the oil spill, have spent a lot of efforts studying bay scallops for restoration, um, St. Joe Bay, St. Andrew Bay, um, ideally Pensacola, but Pensacola is really too fresh. Um, not a great place for bay scallops, but we tried. We figured out the biology, it was not Ideal, so the team that is still working on that is focusing uh, in particular on St. Joe Bay on uh, restoration. We continue to do a little bit of work down here um, through groups like uh, Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, um, Sarasota Baywatch, I'm sure some of you know, tried for years. Um, it's, hard with red, it's hard with the red tide issue. As we were doing this, one of the things that we have to do as base gallop biologists is figure out how many base gallops there were. And so we did a lot of survey work. So. Um, 10 sites, 20 stations, 300 meters of swimming, snorkeling, or scuba diving. Um, that's the picture on the top uh, right corner for you all. Uh, basically, lay a transect, count all the scallops we see, try to enumerate how many are there were. In a lot of places, there are not many bay scallops in Florida. And so, myself and a couple of my coworkers, you keep data as you're swimming. You have a little, um, you know, you carry a slate with you or data sheets. You see a lot of other stuff. We see urchins, we see starfish, and for me in particular, you see a lot of snails. So we started keeping data on what we were seeing, and you can see in the lower right-hand corner, sometimes you find really cool shells. So um, it's notes, we weren't really funded to do this, it was just sort of an extra because you're there. Next slide, please. And so in relation to that work, I got involved with something called the State Wildlife Action Plan. So in every state in the United States, there are species that have lots and lots of funding, like wolves, manatees. Um, there are lots and lots of species that have no funding. They're not hunted, they're not harvested, generally for commercial purposes for the most part. Um, there are these little neglected species that um, we just don't know much about. There are hundreds and hundreds of species around the nation um, that we don't know. So, each state received federal money and were obligated to try to figure out what species need our attention. So I got involved with this because there are lots and lots of people, believe it or not, that study things like tiger beetles on sand ridges, um, crayfish in caves, um, 
things that you wouldn't believe, but the terrestrial habitat knows lots and lots about endangered species. In saltwater, we know very little about endangered species distribution, obscure little critters. Um, so next slide, please. So there was a list, nobody really remembers how this list was created. It was created before I really got involved. Um, the list when I started in the year 2000, number one on the list was banded tulip. I don't know why it was considered a threatened species. Some of the species on there, um, Atlantic gooey duck, I kind of believe they're extant and not a non-native species. They're here, they show up in Abbott. Um, some of the other things you see on there, the cowries, the helmet shells, the tritons, okay, it's basically what I was told was there was a group of people in a room, somebody in the other room was like, hey, what do you know about marine snails? And so somebody from the other room yelled across the hall, and that was what ended up on the list. It was really not very um, scientific. It was just, I had to throw out some names. Queen Conk, of course, in Florida, receives lots and lots of attention, lots of funding. It's a dedicated program. It was a commercial fishery. If you wonder why it receives lots of money and funding, that's part of it. So what we started doing when we were doing this scallop work is we started tabulating the data. It's a little bit hard to see on the graph. Um, now I just have to orient myself to my axis. When you start tabulating your data, what you find is that, for example, there are lots of banded tulips in Tampa Bay, but less banded tulips up in the Panhandle. When you go into seagrasses offshore, you find more true tulips. Um, wherever you go, there are some lightning milks in Florida. They're always there, they're never very abundant in most habitats. Um, horse conch, especially in St. Joe Bay, are present, but they're nowhere are they ever really truly abundant. And so you can't read the numbers on this graph, I'm sure it's pretty obvious, but for a lot of these snails like pear whelks, we were coming up with estimates of something like one per acre. Now I know some of you have gone out and collected and you go to a place and there's, you might see hundreds of pear whelks today. But on, in general, on average, a lot of these species are really not very abundant. And if you look at historic literature, they were more abundant. So next slide, please. Um, and this just kind of accentuates that. We also looked at habitat, and there's some things that probably people in this room know that are fairly obvious. Fighting conch, for example, are found um, in sandy habitats. Crown conch are found on oyster beds or the associated seagrass pits near those. But if you look through the scientific literature, there's very little quantitative, reliable data in the literature that I can take to management and say, are these the species that we should be worried about? Um, and so one of the things we did was just try to document this in a paper. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is just a, a kind of a, to give people an idea, we know that horse conchs are bigger than, for example, crown conchs and tulips. Um, but again, we don't have this kind of information out there to supply to management if, if we have concern about this. So, the first paper really just kind of documented what we were seeing, where we were seeing very common species. Um, as you know, there are lots of other species which we have very little of this data on a quantitative basis. There's, of course, allusions and, and lots of references, but um, we had to start somewhere. So next slide, please. One of the problems I quickly ran into, again, I am not by training a classically trained taxonomist. And as I was publishing, and anybody who has studied even common things like tulips knows, every time I publish a paper, someone renames things like <laughs> tulip shells. And I know there are people in this room that have tried to set up a display for some kind of shell show. What the judges always tell me when I set up mine is, pick a reference, say that this is the reference I used, and go with that and be consistent, because the names are changing constantly even for common things like tulips. And so I've listed, you know, uh, a red form of a fasciolaria tulipa. Uh, is that a species? Is that a subspecies? Is that a form? It depends on which author you talk to. And I try not to get involved in that conversation too much. Um, makes it much harder for me to carry my message when I go try to talk to management about which species we're even talking to. Because remember, the first species on the list that I knew was banded tulip and tree tulip. But in reality, there's some more species. So next slide, please. Um, 
And then my predecessor's predecessor, Bill Lyons, goes and does yet another paper, and turns out there are even more tulips. Um, so this is, this is recent stuff. This is, I think, 2016 uh, was the paper. Um, constantly naming new species. Now, these aren't in Florida, but nonetheless, um, trying to figure out taxonomy can be a challenge. So next slide, please. So taking these species, and one of the reasons that I picked banded tulips and lightning welts is because they were considered a species that was on that list, regardless of how it got made. The way funding works in, in government sources is you have to use things that are things that people are concerned about. So whether that list was appropriate or not, that was what I could get funded for was banded tulips. So um, one of the things we figure out as a marine um, resource manager, I'm, I'm not, I should step back. When I work for Florida Fish and Wildlife, um, I work at the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. My job is to collect as objectively as I can data about abundance, distribution, life history. When I collect that data, I send that off to management. Management decides, do we need to manage these species or not? So for example, if something was endangered, they might consider a rule. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the actual commission, will take the data from the scientists, but they will also take data from things like stakeholders. When you say stakeholders, you might mean hotel owners, you might mean commercial fishermen, um, you might be touristy agencies, all kinds of different groups that can uh, influence a decision. Um, one decision that probably a lot of the people are familiar with is in both Manatee County and Lee County, there is a limit on live shell harvesting. There's a new limit at the Blue Heron Bridge. Those are not rules that came from a scientist. Those are rules that came from advocacy groups. When the commission gets those requests from the community, they might ask me, hey, what do you think about banded tulips being protected? and then I will try to use this kind of data to help them make those decisions. If something is really truly endangered, it's gonna carry more weight um, than something that we don't know about. Um, so for banded tulips, what we did is we tried to figure out how fast do they grow, how old are they when they start to reproduce. We already have an idea how many there were, uh, where they are, so this was the next step in that progression. What you can see are, we call them bee tags, and they're literally, these are really pretty small, not quite juveniles anymore, they're, I would call them sub-adults, but these little tags are about three millimeters, they are literally the tags that if you are a really devoted beekeeper, will fit on the back of a queen bee. And so you can number your queen bees and keep track of them, because it, it just so happens my brother-in-law is a beekeeper, um, and they keep really, really close track, if you're a good beekeeper, of. How many offspring does the bee produce? Are they aggressive? Are they not aggressive? All kinds of traits. Did they live through the winter? We use these tags similarly to try to keep track of individuals. Um, so we did three types of study. One of which is we tagged animals, put them back on the reef. Another of which is we tagged animals and kept them in aquariums. And another is we just went out and every month measured the sizes of some of these animals. All three of these are designed to figure out how fast do these animals grow? Because even for something like a banded tulip or lightning welt, we really don't know how long do they live, how fast does it take to reach adult size, when do they start reproducing. So that was the nature of this study. Next slide, please. Um, if you have never opened up the inside of a snail, and this, is, this part hurts me, but to do the biology right, you have to sacrifice some of the animals. These are actually the reproductive organs from a tulip and a lightning whelk. And so if you've ever tried to clean a live shell, and I know some of you collect live shells, um, it's a personal choice. Some people do, some people don't. Some people eat them, which is all of which is legal. It's a personal choice. Generally, when you clean the snail, you pull all the guts out, you leave the guts, and you eat the meat, which is in the foot. These are the reproductive organs are the farthest tissue all the way up in the whorl of the snail. And so you really have to destroy the snail to get at this because generally um, you can get the meat out, but the, the rest of the soft tissue, the viscera, stays up there. And so if you have never seen the reproductive organs, at least the gonads of a snail, um, this is what they look like. Little tiny soft tissue way, way up um, in the snail. Next slide, please. 
When we get that tissue out, I send it off to a lab. I'm not a histologist. I work with histologists. It's just like getting a patho lab. We take that tissue, we embed it in a resin or in wax, and then someone else stains it. And so, again, a little bit hard to see, but um, the top slide is what it looks like if it's a male. The bottom slide is what it looks like. This is lightning milk. Lightning milk eggs are really big. They're about three millimeters. And if you're used to looking at scallops, scallop eggs are about 65 microns when they're in the scallop. 65 microns is, um, well, it's a lot smaller than human hair. Human hair is about a, a tenth of a meter meter, so um, 0.06 millimeters. So it, it's very tiny. These guys, if you're mentally used to looking at really tiny eggs and all of a sudden you see these big structures under your microscope, you're like, where's all the eggs? And then suddenly it clicks like, oh, the eggs inside the lightning well and even the band of tulip are actually pretty large if you've ever tried to keep them or watch them hatching in an aquarium. They're called crawl away and lightning well, chorus conch, pear well, a lot of the animals that I was studying, they have like two millimeter offspring that come out of the eggs, which is pretty cool. So again, a learning curve for us. Um, next slide, please. What we do with this is we try to figure out how old they are, or in this case, how large they are and when they reproduce. And again, we know if you go out looking on a mud flat, you know that lightning elks the egg cases are generally there in the winter. Um, band of tulips, they are getting ready to mate right now and they will start laying their egg capsules soon and they continue to lay their eggs. So the one that's prominent here is the blue. In the summer, I have to double check. This is a lightning elk. In the summer, the lightning elks are resting. They basically go down in the mud and they rest and they build up that new layer of shell. They're not really doing anything reproductively, but this time of year, they're preparing to move energy into reproduction and they'll get ready to mate and start laying eggs. So again, if I was going to manage this species, I might say, well, don't take, don't harvest them in the winter because they're getting ready to spawn and you're going to affect next year's generation. That's one management tool that we might use. Um, the graph, the other side that's hard to see, and this, this actually surprised me, lightning milk start reproducing at a size of about two and a half inches. They don't produce very many eggs but they are capable of reproducing. So um, was was actually kind of surprising. I figured they would be bigger. Um, it's actually pretty small. Next slide, please. We think that's an age of about three or four years for a lightning milk. This is banded tulip. It looks very, very similar. Banded tulips right now are getting ready to mate. I saw some last time I was out on the beach. Um, they are starting to mate. They will continue to mate into the spring and they will lay eggs January as late as about May, which is kind of cool. Lightning well, or banded tulips, the females mature a little bit larger, but probably about the same age, probably at the age of about two years, um, at the size of about an inch and a half, they have, have their first batch of eggs um, and probably keep spawning for at least two or three years, maybe a little bit more. Um, next slide, please. This is one particular banded tulip that I've had in my aquarium now for four years. Um, and the graph just shows how big she grows. Once they reach a size of about 60 millimeters, banded tulip growth slows down a lot. Um, and what you'll see is, is, especially up near the siphon, they start to chip the siphon. The siphon gets damaged a lot more, but they grow thicker around the world. Um, so, for example, if you were out collecting right now, you'd see a new band of growth on the world, but the, the siphonal end really doesn't grow a huge amount. The little black dots are times that this female laid eggs. So I know that this one female individual in her lifetime has now laid, I can't remember the exact number, it's about 14 batches of eggs. Um, and she's voracious right now. So I'm pretty sure she's gonna try to mate again and we'll start laying eggs. So I don't know how long this particular individual lived, but I know at least four years. So again, it's a tool that I can use if someone comes to ask me, do we need to manage the species because if they mate once and lay one batch of eggs, it's very different than if they lay a whole bunch of them. So next slide, please. The case I think probably is a little bit different and some of you may or may not have seen the paper. Um, this is a picture by someone I met at an outreach event called Brenda Martin. I just love the picture. Um, she came to me because she got bit by an octopus while shell collecting because she had a little pile of shells on her leg. One of them had a little tiny octopus in it and it came out and it bit her. So I get this panda call and it turns out that yes, all octopus have venom and they can bite you no matter how small. And, uh, and it caused a little like bee sting looking thing. Um, and apparently it hurt. So. 
Anyway, I got together with a, a partner at the University of South Florida called Greg Herbert, um, and we did some aging studies on horse conch. Because horse conch is one I am particularly worried about um, because it's so collectible and it's so obvious. And it seems like, especially around um, Sanibel, St. Joe, maybe some of the 10,000 islands, that they form mating groups. Those mating groups you could very easily overharvest. So, next slide, please. Don't try to read the graph. What Greg does is he looks at chemicals, in particular oxygen isotopes in the shell, and all you need to take home is that those wiggly blue lines, a valley and a peak, represent one year. And so he can look at the chemistry. One isotope is used preferentially when it's cold, and one is used preferentially when it's warmer, and estimate about how long they live. Now, I figured, because I published this based on basically a guess, that horse conch could live 50 to 100 years. I didn't know, but it sure seemed like they lived a long time. There was a paper out there that said they only grow a couple of millimeters a year when they get big. The Bailey Matthews has one that's 600 millimeters. So I figured, well, if you're growing one millimeter a year, you probably live a long time. Well, it turns out that growth curve was for a male. The males slow down a lot. They don't really grow after they reach about 45 millimeter or 45 centimeters. The female just keeps growing. And so the one at Bailey Matthews is almost certainly a female. We don't know how big they would get, but probably about that big. I mean, uh, there might be a bigger one out there somewhere, but um, so my estimate was from a male, that one was from a female. They both only live about 14 to 16 years, and that's it. Um, next slide, please. The other thing that we found out is that horse conch don't start reproducing right away. They don't start reproducing until they're about seven or eight years old. And so if you try to collect horse conch, and I don't know how many of you have found a really big horse conch lately, um, probably not that many people. If they don't start reproducing until they're a foot long and they only live to be about 18 inches, um, that means they're only getting four or five years to reproduce. And again, this is me just guessing, but based on the size that the horse conch egg mass is, I don't think they reproduce more than once per year. It's just so energetically costly to make that huge mass of eggs. I can't prove that, but I mean, I'm sure some of the people in this room have seen a really large horse conch egg mass, and they're just so big. I don't think they can do that more than once a year. Um, but this was, this was surprising to me, because this means there's very, very few females out there in the population that are reproductively active, and they don't have very many years. So that's the kind of species I am trying to raise concern to our management side to say, hey, we're a little bit worried about this species. Um, what can we do about it? So next slide, please. Most marine snails in Florida can be harvested. The exception is queen conch. Every other species of, of snails in Florida, um, there is essentially no rules um, for their collection for live snails. Next slide, please. Again, a little bit hard to read. Um, I know um, a little bit small, but there are things that we think of as being harvested for food. In particular, one of the foods um, that is being harvested a lot right now is a hawkwing conch. It is fished commercially because there's no queen conch left to harvest. So on the right side, um, the blue is the total harvest since 2010. The orange is the harvest from 2000 to 2010. Um, and the gray is harvest before that. And so what you're seeing is on the order of um, 50 to 100,000 pounds of hawkwing conch being harvested per year commercially. Um, some of the other species, the one that surprised me, and I, I don't have an explanation totally for this, but periwinkles are being harvested. Um, I don't know if it's really truly periwinkles or if it's somebody that is classifying a whole bunch of stuff that looks like periwinkles. I'm trying to get that answer, but there's this tremendous harvest from what people are telling me, they are being harvested for sale in Europe, and they're actually used as either as escargot or as broth or something. I don't even know, but periwinkles are very popular in Europe. Um, something I'm trying to figure out. If anybody has any thoughts about that, come up to me after. Um, lightning whelk are being harvested primarily for bait, um, for crab traps. Um, if you've ever tried to eat snails, you know that lightning whelk meat is actually pretty tough when you first get it out. And so people smash the snail, 
um, and they just leave it in the trap because it's a really tough meat and it lasts a long time. So, um, tulips, horse conchs are harvested occasionally. On the other side are things called marine life. And marine life also kind of surprised me when I first started doing this. I was like, what is all this stuff? Well, they're not pounds, those are actually numbers. Um, the one on the top is called a star snail. And anybody in the room keep an aquarium? I don't know if anybody does. So there's somebody, uh, at least one I see in the crowd. I keep an aquarium. There are a lot of snails that you can either collect or buy from pet stores that are really good at grazing the algae. And if you keep a saltwater aquarium, you get this sort of brown, hazy gunk that is very hard to clear. Well, star snails, turbo snails, a couple of others like top snails are really good at eating keeping your aquarium clean. The other thing they're really good at is food for things like spiny lobsters. And so people keep all kinds of different things in their aquariums, and these are being sold for a variety of reasons. The number that you probably can't read is that since the year 2000, we have harvested about 20 million of these star snails from Florida waters. They are primarily coming out of Miami-Dade and Monroe counties. And what do we have in Miami-Dade and Monroe counties that we're worried about? We have a coral reef tract. So these are snails that go along the bottom and they graze. They scrape the algae off the surface. Um, they make new settlement habitat for coral polyps. We are harvesting them at these really high rates. And so again, it's a species that I am worried about. Um, we're trying to, again, gain some information about this. Next slide, please. So just if you haven't seen them, there are a number of different lithopoma. The one that more people from this region are familiar with is lithopoma phoebium, the, the long spine star snail. Um, this is lithopoma americanum. There are a couple of other very similar lithopomas. Um, there are a couple of turbos. Um, this one is the chestnut turban. Um, and there are some top snails. It turns out top snails are really hard to find live. Um, anyway, next slide please just in case you didn't know the species I was talking about. So this is just a graph which shows harvest since 1990. And just to accentuate, most of that harvest is coming from Miami-Dade and Monroe counties. There's a little bit of harvest out of Tampa Bay. That doesn't mean they're harvested from Tampa Bay. They're generally coming from, for example, the, the area where the sponges are um, off of Tarp and Hernando counties. Um, so there's a little bit of harvest from other places, but again, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on with this crazy industry. Next slide, please. So inevitably, some of you will know the movie that this is from. Um, I get that question, like, what's going on with all these turbo snails? And I don't know. So we got some more money to try to look at this. Next slide, please. Please, we'll go quick. This is a picture from Biscayne Bay. If you've ever been down there, Biscayne Bay is an awesome place to go snorkeling. Uh, we left out of Black's Marina, went straight across to some of those passes. We also worked all through the Keys to try to figure out even just a baseline of are things like turbos and star snails and top shells even present? Are they abundant? If they're super abundant, maybe we don't have to worry about them. Um, next slide, please. So just to put it in perspective, the green dots on this map, um, as you go through the Keys, there are American star snails wherever there is seagrass throughout the Keys tract. And we only worked in a little narrow tract. We didn't really get up into Florida Bay. We didn't go out and try to look at coral because if you've ever dove on coral, you know it's just about impossible to do in a reasonable amount of time an, an objective survey. It's just super complex. So I stuck to sandy habitat, seagrass, some of the spongy hard bottom just to try to get an initial estimate. And um, it turns out there's a lot of American star snails. I'm a little bit less worried now that I've been there because there's about one per square meter. Well, there's something like a million acres of habitat times 4,000 acres per kilometer. So a little bit less concerned because there's just so much habitat that they are present in. Um, what you can't see, I, didn't, I have a similar map for chestnut turban, which are also very commonly harvested. Chestnut turban are very, very specific to some habitat that we can't find. Um, the commercial fishermen tell me they're abundant, but they won't tell me where. So if you know anybody who is a marine life harvester, um, my impression is it's things like under the Seven Mile Bridge and places that I'm not really skilled enough to go dive. But they say they're abundant, I can't find them. So there's a little disjunct between the data that we collected and the data that people are telling me. Um, so again, this is a species 
that I'm a little less worried about now that we went and collected some data. Okay, they're, they're still probably doing okay. Next slide, please. So where else can we go? There's lots and lots of questions that I have, and I'll, I'll keep talking. So next slide, please. Um, so back to this list. Um, the list gets modified. Um, I am asked to comment on this about every five years. My opinion is one of many people's opinions, and there's lots and lots of people that study things like beach mice that have louder opinions, I guess. So on the current list of things that the state of Florida is worried about as potentially endangered species are two species of cone. All that other stuff fell off the list. Conus Pirella sternzi, which some of you know as Conus sternzi, was recently renamed yet again. Um, very frustrating. <laughs> Conus anabathrum, Florida cone snail. Um, apparently fairly abundant, fairly wide ranging. Conus or Conus Pirella sternzi, at least in some literature, only is present in the 10,000 Islands area. Some other literature suggests there have been a single sample collected in Cedar Key um, and up in the Panhandle. So again, something I'm trying to figure out is if it's really truly restricted to a single county, Lee County, and it's the only place in the world you can find that, it is much more concerning for me than if it's gulf wide and it lives out to 50 meters and it's kind of small anyway, it's very, very hard to collect alive. Um, so we are currently seeking funding to try to answer that question, partly because it's the only snail on the list that I can get funded. Whenever I do these studies, I do lots and lots of other associated stuff because I'm out in the field looking and keeping data. So next slide, please. If you have an interest in cones, you probably have the book by Cone, um, which describes sort of statistically how he described to what species of what. And it's, it's really, really hard to tell cones because a lot of them are super similar. And so this is just a graph showing that if you use statistics, the shape of many different cone shells is hard to tell apart. And so we are working on that. Um, one of the issues with cones is that when they're a juvenile at say a half a centimeter versus, you know, most cones only get to a few inches, but their shape does change as they grow. So next slide, please. Uh, again, working with um, a colleague, Greg Herbert at USF, we're trying to figure out how to apply some of the math that cone did to describe cones to look at how their shape changes as they grow and try to figure out how many species of cone we actually have in Florida. It's, it's not something I'm really great at, but we're trying. Um, I won't leave on that. So next slide, please. Um, all those other species I'm still kind of worried about. Um, when was the last time you collected a really big helmet shell or a triton? I bet most people in this room have, or there are probably some people that have, but I bet not lately. And so I'm still kind of worried. Um, even um, things that are not on this list, like a flamingo tongue and a, a, some of the big murex, the hexaplex, um, assuming it's still hexaplex. So um, I am trying to work on what species would I personally worry about and what species do I think need a little bit more protection. Next slide, please. One of the things that concerns me is that the data which is collected for marine snails is not super accurate. We don't have a lot of species on the list. We currently keep data on about 60 species of snail. By my guess, using all the references I can find, we have about 1,300 species of snail which are either in Florida or associated federal waters. Um, this is a category called other snail. So if you are a marine life collector, which is selling something for an aquarium or for shells that you collected alive, you can report it as just other. And if you look at the numbers, we're approaching something like 300,000 snails per year, which are being collected and sold somewhere, and I don't know what species they are. I don't know anything about what is being collected and sold. It could be sold anywhere in the world once it's harvested. Um, so again, I'm just trying to figure out what it is. You know, what it is that's even being harvested. Next, please. Oh, and I should point out on that slide, again, most of that is being collected from Miami-Dade and Monroe County, and it's just other, and I, I don't know. Um, if you have ever tried to buy a shell online, um, I didn't ever used to do this, but now I'm kind of curious. So when I started working on this, I went online, and it turns out you can buy just about any species of shell online. 
Of course, you can go to online auctions, which have been, especially in, in organizations like COA, we know about certain auctions. But nowadays, you can go to Etsy, you can go to Craigslist, you can go to Facebook Marketplace. There's a hundred different places. Um, and even something like a horse conch, you're talking about for a world record prize sized shell, prices exceeding a thousand dollars. Right? So if you are a collector and you know what has value, and you come across a horse conch that's 50 or 60 centimeters, you know, a two foot horse conch, the temptation to collect a shell, which is a hundred dollars, um, gets really strong. Um, clean helmets, a little bit less, but I don't hear reports of many people collecting clean helmets lately. Uh, and again, uh, something like a Triton, um, you just don't find Tritons live. Most of the people, I don't scuba dive in the Keys much anymore, but um, I see occasionally pictures from like Blue Heron Bridge and some of the East Coast beaches. Most of those are from people who are photographing. One of the places that I hear stories about, I don't know if they're true or not, again, I'm trying to verify, is that some of the shrimpers now know, hey, I can sell these things. Um, crabbers, and especially some of the deep water crabbers, will collect shells because they know some of this stuff is marketable. Um, again, basically unregulated. So next, please. I thought I should also mention, because of where we are, uh, and it's pertinent to some of the people in this room, you may have interest, we also work a lot on oysters. That's actually most of the work that I do right now is oysters, in particular related to the Everglades and the oil spill. So next slide, please. Um, one of the projects I have right now, and a little backstory, I became involved with the oil spill the day of the oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon in 2010. Um, I happened to be in the work doing some, I was in the paint handle doing scallop work, um, got a call and somebody said, can you go out to the beach and collect some sand? Let's get some baseline samples for how much oil is present on the beach before the oil gets here. So that day, we got a call, go out to the beach and collect some samples because we need, need that baseline. Um, and so we got into oysters right away. We had been involved in oysters, but the oil spill really ratcheted up our interest in oil. Um, so we are starting this year a project which is still being funded out of the oil spill, Deepwater Horizon. There will be money spent related to the oil spill, Deepwater Horizon, for at least another decade, probably 20 years. Um, I am currently collaborating on a project related to bay scallops, which we were told we would be funded in 2010. We didn't have the actual money in hand until 2015 to start that project. That's how slow some of these federal government programs work. It's, it can be really frustrating. So the project we are working on right now is just to try to document the baseline, because we don't have that for Pensacola, St. Andrew Bay, uh, Horseshoe, Suwannee, Tampa Bay, believe it or not, and Charlotte Harbor. We really don't have a thorough understanding of how many oysters are present in some of these estuaries. So I figured since I'm pretty close to Charlotte Harbor, maybe I should talk a little bit about that. So um, <laughs> next slide, please. So the, when the, one of the first projects that I got involved with it is, is not related to the oil spill, it's actually related to Everglades restoration. And I know in this community you're aware, Everglades water used to go to the Everglades, now Okeechobee water goes to St. Lucie and to Caloosahatchee, um, and it can have a profound impact on those ecosystems. Oysters make a really good indicator species because oysters cannot move. Oysters are present in a certain place in the estuary, they are present upstream and downstream of that place that they really like, but if you change the water flow, you will affect how the oysters are doing. But because they cannot move like a fish or a crab, um, they are a very good uh, roadmap to what is happening in the estuary. So um, we call them indicator species or keystone species because they also make habitat. Um, so we have been funded by the, the South Florida Water Management District um, since 2005 to work on this project. It's a 50 year uh, restoration project, quote unquote, to restore the Everglades to some kind of original flow. And oysters will be a metric. Um, have we fixed oysters? Um, so it's a little bit hard to see, but in the lower left hand corner, um, we do have stations that we monitor in the Caloosahatchee River and San Carlos Bay. I have not been back there. I have been told I should not get in the water um, in that area, uh, especially the, the lower reaches of the, the Caloosahatchee River, 
um, much less places like Fort Myers Beach. There are still people that are getting infections just from getting in the water. Um, I'm not entirely sure about this area because there was also a huge, I know you all know this, because you were infected more than me, um, the Peace River had a tremendous amount of flooding. And so we are supposed to start a project in this area, but we just don't know yet. So next slide, please. Um, the project that I'm starting is called the Technical Implementation Group Funding. And essentially it is just assessing the oil spill still. Um, and it, it's not gonna show up in this map, but one of my regions is Charlotte Harbor. Next slide, please. For oyster mapping, if you go into the FWC website and you try to look at our oyster resource map, there's just about no oysters according to our database in the north half of Charlotte Harbor. I know there are oysters here. There has to be. There are creeks, there are mangroves, there are seawalls. I'm sure that there are oysters here, but we haven't mapped them. And so if you haven't mapped them, they're not real, right? They're not in any kind of GIS database. They just don't exist. So that's part of my job over the next three years is to work with our GIS group to try to figure out where the oysters are, what kind of condition they're in. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Again, you can't really see this, but if you have ever launched a boat from the Punta Rasa ramp on your way out to Sanibel, um, as you go out to Sanibel, there, there's a boat ramp right on your, on your right on the north side that's called the Punta Rasa ramp. It's one of the busiest ramps in the region. It's a wonderful ramp unless it's covered with four feet of the Sanibel Causeway and palm trees and all the debris from Fort Myers. So I think it's back to order, but again, we will not sample that until we know it's safe to get back in the water. But that region, and especially up into Mat Lachey, there are lots of oysters, at least there were in August. Um, so this will be a site that we'll try to increase our information on, but probably won't start until the January. So just kind of give you all a feel. If anyone has a strong opinion or knows about places you can find oysters in the north half of the bay and wants to come up and talk to me, I would love it. Um, or reach out to me afterwards. Um, I've tried to work with, for example, some of you may know Betty Stogler. She used to be the Sea Green agent. Um, just trying to figure out where do we even go start looking. So one of the projects coming up. So next slide, please. Um, one more. Yeah, just keep going, paint forward. I know it's hard to see under. There's little tiny red dots, which are, are the known oysters. So next slide, please. So um, in my program, I work in molluscan fisheries, which is part of the shellfish group at the Research Institute. I will be primarily focused on oysters over the next few years, but I try to mix in all this snail work uh, when I can. Um, one of the things I want to do is just try to come up with a list. And for example, I know there's a new book coming out on the peanut island shells. There's lots of resources, but just try to figure out what is present in Florida waters. What are species that I'm worried about? If you know what a cecum is, I'm not worried about a cecum. There are little two millimeter snails that live 100 feet deep in ocean mud. Um, very few people in this room probably know what they are or collect them. Um, but maybe something like the tritons and the horse punks might have concerns. So I'm going to try to come up with a list of things that I can throw out there to groups that we should be concerned about. Um, I'm always trying to be an advocate um, that right now, if you are a commercial fisherman, beyond the rules, for example, for live shells in Lee County and Manatee County, um, commercial fishermen have no limit on how many mollusks that they can harvest in a day. Commercial products license, if you see it, you can harvest it. If you are a recreational fisherman, there are a few species that are on the quote unquote marine life list, which um, means you can't collect more than one per day per species of live animals, but it's, I should have it in my head, I don't. But for every other species, you can collect 80 pounds per day. Um, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen 80 pounds of lightning elk in a day, but um, I'm gonna focus on the species that are on the current list, the species of greatest conservation need, which are the two cones, which may or may not even be perfect species, but we'll try. Um, I'm trying to reach out to as many universities as I can because there are so many, especially just snails, they make great master's level projects where students can go out and learn the basics of the life history, the abundance, where they are, what habitats do they prefer, what season do they spawn, all that kind of information. They're great 
even senior thesis level for some of this. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to make those connections. Um, and then I, I mentioned some of the regional oyster projects. If you have any questions about any of those, um, next slide. And I think that this, this was, most of this work was funded by the State Wildlife Grants Program. I always have to acknowledge that. It's a federal program that our agency distributes as a block grant to people like myself and sometimes universities. So again, I'll take any questions if, uh, if you have any questions about some of the work I described. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so for those of you that couldn't hear, um, when you take a species and you harvest it at some level, it will have effects on other species. Um, to some degree we do, to a large extent, we don't manage on those ecosystem level changes. One of the questions that we were recently dealing with um, is that in a lot of places there are endangered hermit crabs that only live near shore. Um, and we have, I forget the name of the hermit crab that lives on the east coast, but they need big shells to reach a reproductive size. So if you take too many of whatever their home is, you will have a negative effect on this potentially endangered species. Um, horse conch are very good predators on pen shell. Pen shell is a really awesome habitat for lots of other stuff. Toadfish and clingfish and shrimp and little crabs. It's well documented that they affect the entire ecology of the St. Joe Bay system. And so there are some papers, but it's, it's just, it's a really difficult question to figure out if I affect this species, what other species are negatively affected? So, I know I saw uh, some other hands out there. Yes? Do you want to find a lot of chestnut turbans go up by Anclo? Honeymoon Island, there are thousands of them up there. I was there maybe a year and a half ago. Thousands. So, on the beaches. The beach has lots and lots of shell. For the life of me, I don't know where the live animals are. Um, we have tried trawling, we've tried diving. They're there somewhere. I, one, of, one of the things that someone suggested, and if, again, if you have any thoughts about this, some people will tell me that the chestnut turbines are at the base of the grass blades and they come up at night. Uh, again, I don't know. I mean, a lot of snails are cryptic like that, where they come out and feed at night. Uh, I'm open to suggestions because they are hard to find live ones. But, but yeah, thank you. So there, um, there are lots of autonomous underwater vehicles and, and almost all the really good deep sea research now is done with, with something like an AUV. Um, for the snail project in the Keys, we tried just the simplest version, which is just a, a drop cam. So you basically just take a GoPro, you attach it to a frame, you drop it to the bottom. You really just don't have the resolution to see things like star snails. Um, they're, they're pretty cryptic. They like to get in the clusters of algae and stuff. Um, we're trying, um, but the little guys, I mean, especially uh, like a cirrus or something like that, they're just really hard to see remotely, but we try. <laughs> we try. You mentioned the um, harvesting of the periwinkles and going out of the country, and I was just wondering if there was a lot of species, Florida species, that get harvested and sent out of the country. <laughs> so, um, I have, I've had one marine life dealer, in other words, there are people harvesting, they go through a middleman who accumulates the stuff that the harvest are, and they, they sell them, uh, essentially like a seafood wholesaler. There are similar things for the live harvest. Um, he doesn't deal with periodicals, and so he didn't know. Um, I just can't get that community to open up, and it's, it's probably just me 
you know, they see the FWC label and I walk in or I call them and they, they shut. So when I go to places like FOM or when I come to meetings like this, every once in a while, I'll make that connection. And, you know, somebody says, hey, I know Joe from Sammy Seafood and, you know, talk to him. And I occasionally get names. It's just a really close-knit community that's very, very hard to, to try to figure out. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always open to suggestions if people have names or connections. And again, I don't even know that they're actually periwinkles or that somebody is just, that's a code and they kind of look like periwinkles and that's the easiest thing they put on their, their, uh, their landing sheet. Um, Cynthia Barnett said something. She said, mollusks are the canary in the coal mine. And so, in your opinion right now in Florida, what's the state of shelling as far as, are we in good shape or are we in, uh, is there, what can we do as, as shell collectors to help, help, help uh, the shelling population as a whole? So, if you couldn't hear, the, the question is, What's the overall condition of mollusks in Florida, and what can we do as a community to try to, to help that if there's a problem? One of the problems is I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so just trying to figure out, you know, I have an oyster paper that I was on. The best data that we could find was from 1905 through about 1915. We know in 1905 most oysters around the country were already over harvested, but that's the best data we have. Um, they were harvesting in the 1600s. You know, as soon as colonial America started, there was massive harvest of oysters from, by Native Americans. And um, in Cynthia's book, she talks about um, Tampa Bay, there's tons of shell mounds. Pine Island, there's tons of shell mounds. They're, they're all over. Um, so even getting the baseline for some of the very common things like oysters is really, really hard. Um, when I published the work that we published on, you know, very common stuff, lightning whelks, horse conks, um, the numbers that we see are lower than places that have better data than us, which is sad, but like Belize and, and in Central America, they're much more attuned to their marine harvest and they have a long enough database that they can show their stocks were over harvested. Mm -hmm. And so our data, when we do things like how many oysters do we find or, or you know, this, this this whole room is probably a less than a quarter acre. So if you're finding one lightning whelk in every quarter acre, compared to historic data from places where that data exists, Florida is generally overfished for some of the things that we still consider common. I mean, I don't think anybody in this room thinks that lightning whelks are rare yet, um, but they probably were much more abundant historically. And so trying to piece that together is hard. Um, when I look at landings, one of the ones that stood out at me, um, if you look at landings going back to the early 90s, um, the flamingo tongues were pretty common. Their landings have dropped off to almost nothing. Um, it's an odd species. I have no idea how that got on the list of things that they were keeping track of, but um, flamingo tongues are at least an order, if not two orders of magnitude less harvested than they were. Is that because nobody wants them anymore? I doubt that because flamingo tongue's a little cool shell and they definitely are an aquarium species. So there are some species which I have information on. Um, I always encourage people, if it's alive, unless it's a really, really special specimen that you don't have in your collection yet, especially if it's damaged, let it be. Um, there's lots and lots of empty shells. Um, you know, just if you're out collecting, and I know, like, I do this still, like, you see a crown conch that's got a new set of spines that's different from what you have, and it's got really good stripes. You don't need 50 from that oyster reef, but it might be cool to have one. So, I mean, in general, especially for common stuff, I just try to say, like, use a little bit of restraint. Um, the, the area that I have, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about, and, I, and we talked about it a little bit before the meeting, these trips down to the 10,000 islands. If you're taking mostly shell, I don't honestly know. I don't know if that's harmful or not. Uh, that's, it's, a, it's not an easy question. Um, it might matter a lot to sea turtles that are losing their nesting beaches. I don't think we're taking that much shell yet. Um, 
but some of the pictures I see online, you know, do you need five gallons, half of which is tulip shells and lightning rods? I don't know. I mean, maybe you're a crafter. I don't know. Um, to some degree, to each their own, it's legal. Um, but especially for live species, my goal is to try to figure out what species we should be concerned about. Um, as I said in the beginning, the Blue Heron Bridge was almost totally driven by stakeholders who were worried that there was over-harvest, and it's a really, really valuable industry for the dive community there. Um, so they tried to protect that resource, that rule got passed. The Lee County mandate was driven, my understanding is, by shell clubs from, from this coast. Um, that there were people in, and I don't remember which clubs, but the people from the shell clubs got together and said, hey, and obviously the commerce at Sanibel said, yes, we want to protect that resource, protect that heritage. Um, so if there's a concern, it, the commission will listen to stakeholders much more than they will, I don't know about much more, but they consider the opinion of the stakeholders pretty heavily, especially if they can show an economic interest of protecting a resource, whatever. Um, so, I, and the St. Pete Show Club in their newsletter has a creed, like, take a picture, if you don't need it in your collection, put it back where you found it, put it back, you know, a curriculum upside down, put, turn the rocks back over, all those kind of things, you know, especially if it's a damaged shell, unless you're one of those people that really, really wants a collection of cool damaged shells, which sometimes <laughs> it's amazing, whatever, that's, um, I've seen some really nice shell show things, but, Generally, I try to keep a nice specimen, and that's, for me, it's, it's moderation, you know. Yeah, I take occasional, especially hermit crab shells, sometimes I will take much more readily than I will take a live shell. Um, usually, and this is just me personally, if I see a crab that I really, really, I, I just love that shell, I take it with the hermit crab, I put it in my aquarium. Almost inevitably, they will move to a new shell. Um, that's sort of my answer to, you know, <laughs> If it's just really tempting, you know. <laughs> um, and it, it's surprising how often they, they do, you know. So then I'm just trying to reduce my footprint a little. I, I don't know how else to, you know. Thank you. Yeah. I don't think you your aquarium. <laughs> my biggest aquarium is a 30 gallon. It's not super big by saltwater standards. Yeah. Um, it's it's a local Tampa Bay stuff. So it's just whatever... It's not one of these really fancy coral aquariums. Saltwater aquariums are not as hard as you would think. Um, and right now it's going much better than my freshwater aquarium. Freshwater aquariums, because somebody asked, if you ever have a freshwater aquarium and you think, oh, cool, I'll put a, marine, uh, a freshwater snail in my aquarium, or plant it from a pet shop and put it in your aquarium, don't, just don't, just. <laughs> Once you get freshwater snails in your aquarium, they're just about impossible to control, so. Uh, lesson I am currently learning. <laughs> Anything else? Happy to take questions, I guess, at the break. If, if yes. anybody has one.